Good morning. Welcome to all of you who are joining us. We have the honor of having with us today not only a retired intermediate court of appeals judge and former head of school at St. Louis and former University of Hawaii chief counsel, Walter Kiyomitsu, but Ben Davis, a really good friend for many years, former head of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution a longtime professor of law at the University of Toledo School of Law, active in international as well as domestic law in many, many areas, a leader in diversity, a leader in rights, defense, and enforcement. Ben, welcome to Think Tech. Thank you very much. So our starting question for today is, for the you gentlemen, what's happening out there? relative to the rule of law that gives you serious concern? Well, if I can start, um, and this is literally today, um, I'm, getting, uh, I'm getting a wisdom tooth out tomorrow. So people listening in, you know what a wisdom tooth operation is for you or one of your kids uh, and what it entails, okay? General anesthesia, right? But this is the twist. In the pandemic, when I went to see the uh, surgeon that my dentist said to go to, I had to sign a form that said that I acknowledge the COVID-19 pandemic risk in getting this operation done. And so it's kind of an assumption of risk by me if a judge had to look at this uh, and how the rules of law of contracts would apply to that. But beyond that, as of yesterday, and I'm telling you folks, it is as of yesterday, the, uh, Ohio, uh, the Ohio has passed a law, limitation of liability law for COVID-19 that covers essentially every kind of business and basically pro uh, prohibits any class action type of action. And uh, basically, if you get COVID-19 out of uh, in some business, like this surgeon tomorrow, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I'm out of luck. I'm out of luck. And that those kinds of limitation liabilities, I understand, are going around in different states in the United States. This is a state law. I understand that in federal law, uh, you know, this this stimulus package, that one of the holdups is an effort to have a federal limitate COVID-19 limitation of liability. And so my my thought is that's law and it's a rule, but I'm wanting to sue uh, or, or get a, a get a, I, I'm thinking about everyone who just has to go to the dentist or goes to a pharmacist or something like a pharmacy and whether how judges would respond to that. Would they accept this constitutional claim on the state level? And there some people have shown me some parts of the Ohio constitution that might be invoked uh, or a federal level claim. Um, um, I, you can think on the international level too. If there was, uh, uh, there's a rule in the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights is that in a public emergency, which we are in now, we are in a public emergency, duly declared. You know, you can derogate from these human rights rules uh, to the extent strictly necessary, right? That's and so the question is, is this kind of limitation of liability strictly necessary under that vision? for purposes of, of dealing with this. And I would add that the abnormal, I think, is that is the COVID. The COVID is a relentless, implacable force, deadly force, right? 200,000 people there. You know, we can think about politicians and judges and all that and this, that, or the other, but the bottom line is that's the thing that's out there. And then the question is more about what are all of our responses? What are the responses of courts? What are the responses of judges? What are the responses of political leaders to that implacable, relentless, deadly, abnormal that we live in? And quite honestly, this particular rule bothers me. It seems like it's basically saying, well, we'll protect the companies and entities, but you who actually can get sick from this stuff, you're on your own. That's the thing that bothers me right now. So we know the test for 
the legislative, executive, and especially the judicial branch has always been a balancing of interests between the rights of the individual and the protections of society. And you've raised that very aptly, Ben, because Senator McConnell has basically laid down the law, if you will, that he's not even going to consider putting in front of the Senate a bill that does not include waivers of liability for healthcare professionals, for employers, for businesses related to COVID exposure. One of the questions where that comes up, under other areas of law, Occupational Safety and Health Act law, employers have a duty that is not delegable to others to maintain a safe workplace environment in compliance with accepted health and legal codes and ordinances. This law might act in direct conflict with that duty, that requirement. Yes. And you especially consider that you're going to have that protection when you're dealing with a healthcare provider because you're there because of health risks. Your wisdom tooth extraction involves health risks, general anesthesia, oral surgery, other procedures where there is a heightened risk, but there's also a heightened duty where the law has imposed higher duties on healthcare professionals to not only provide a safe working environment for patients, but to provide informed consent that is much higher than the level you would expect as an employee going into your workplace, as a student going into your school, or in other, and as a customer going into a retail business. Yeah. So the balancing now is being called into question. And one of the reasons that we're here is because that balancing test is being politicized by mm. people like McConnell, by courts. Quick example in Pennsylvania, where there have been a number of test cases about the governor's restrictions because of the healthcare emergency, masks, social distancing, closures of some establishments that create especially high risks of disease transmission. Those have been challenged and so far the challenges have been rejected by the courts. Within the last week or so, one of the Pennsylvania judges, a federal judge, has declared that healthcare emergency restrictions cannot supersede First Amendment protections. That's the balancing test. What's your take on that? Well, let me just make a couple of comments. One is, I think um, Ben's personal case really puts into issue this balancing that you, you're talking about, uh, Chuck, is the balancing or the respect for the rule of law that must be protected by the, by the judiciary. And you must give the judici ju judiciary an independence uh, to rule on the, on the issue of the uh, protection of um, the traditional rights of consumers. Okay? Now, Ben brought up that this might be a violation of the state of Ohio Constitution. It may also be a violation of the federal US Constitution. And certainly a consumer in Ben's situation should have the right to bring a class action or an action to protect the rights of the traditional rights of the consumer and let the judiciary rule on and give them the independence to rule on this issue of law and if they are following the traditional rule of law, they should declare that this legislative action is politically or is just motivated by non-legitimate you know, legal issues. So I think this is a classic example of 
the balancing of the traditional judicial independence versus political manipulation. And that, that does uh, bring up the point of the, for example, and, and this is going to sound a little cynical, Judge, but I can imagine the legislature passing a law that they know will be struck down, but politically, mm. it, it looks good for them for purposes of their re-election in two, two months. <laughs> right. That's right. And, and you know, and a, and a very, very similar case just um, was decided about a week ago in Florida, where the Florida uh, uh, voters passed a state constitutional amendment to give uh, 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 citizens with, with uh, felony convictions uh, the right to vote, and the Florida legislature passed a bill saying, no, they have a right to vote, but they first must pay all fines, yeah. restitution, and fees that are pending before they are able to vote or register to, to vote. So the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, as you know, ruled that the, the voters, the uh, felons uh, in prison, they must pay the fines. <laughs> yeah, before they register to vote. Yeah. And, uh, and this was strictly politically motivated because the majority of the 11th Circuit that ruled in, in that way were all Republican appointed uh, judges. And the yeah. dissent was all democratically appointed judges. And one of the dissenters said, if you require the felons to uh, pay all their fines and so forth before they register to vote, it's impossible because Florida does not have a database to, <laughs> to, to track you know, who was paying, who paid fines and who did not pay fines and so forth. So it makes it impossible for about 700,000 voters to vote in the, to even register to vote uh, by this 11th Circuit Court of Appeals uh, decision. So this was again another example of the breach of the rule of law, where political manipulation is affecting the rights of voters or citizens to vote. You know, so yeah. there are a lot of different classic examples of intervention or encroachment between the uh, you know the legislative or the judiciary or in encroaching on the judicial independence yeah and that, that then that is a violation of the rule of law that we, we're speaking of yeah now, they, those two cases yeah. share a common thread which is in each case especially Florida 65 percent of the voters have passed <clears throat> the constitutional amendment. That's right. Enabling those who have served their felony conviction sentences to vote. Yes. They didn't say anything about fines or retribution or fees. The Republican controlled legislature basically overrode the will of two thirds of the Florida voters and said, we're gonna make them pay those fines even though, as you say, we don't have a database to be able to tell them what they are. <laughs> it's impossible for them right. to it's register. A, you know, it's those classic kind of uh, <laughs> facing people in front of catch-22s, even if they want to. I've heard that there are some NBA players or some play, uh, or, or professional players who said they're going to pony up money mm. that the, these people could pay. But then you get to the next point is, where is the database on how much X owes? Uh, yep. and, you know, and so, and then they pay that. And then where is it registered at what point that they have duly paid so that they can have the proof? And then once they, how do they get the proof to do it? It's all this administrative games you can play till, oh, I'm sorry, it's after the point for you to register. I'm terribly sorry. But in 2024 or 22, there, you'll be in good shape, you know. <laughs> it's too late by that time. Right, exactly. Um, if, if it's any consolation, um, 
I like to say there's nothing new under the sun in the sense that there's a speech made in 1901 by a guy named, he was a congressman, George C. White. He was the last black congressman in uh, the House of Representatives after reconstruction from the South. And he, uh, it, it was called the farewell of the Negro to Congress, you know, and he made a long speech about the shenanigans that were run in his district, you know, where, I don't know, there are 300 people registered and magically 800 votes happened against them, you know what I mean, this kind of stuff, you know, I mean, you would not believe what he details about all of, of the manipulations. Uh, it's just now it's much more sophisticated, so to speak, and at levels that are really extraordinary. I don't know if you saw that uh, consultant who died and they found all these uh, uh, USB drives with all the ways he had done to calculate uh, the, the, the shape of districts so that there would be uh, Republican majorities, uh, even though the population would have been majority, uh, probably Democrats. So you'd have say 30% Republicans, but they'd have 60% of the seats, you know, and he, he was very good at doing this kind of stuff, you know, right. You know, I mean, that's, that's a, like a level of sophistication to, to these processes. And what I hope and I, what I see sometimes and definitely is that, you know, the judges catch this. I remember a number of times in Ohio elections, 2004, 2008, 2012, where there were, I think it was an issue about uh, registrations would not be accepted because the paper wasn't except the right thickness. You know what I mean? That kind of stuff. And, and, that, and a complaint was made and saying, no, those people are registered. You know, That's uh, crazy. every kind of little sort of executive game to maintain power had to be countered by these legions of sophisticated election lawyers to go in and get a decision like in two seconds, you know, and yeah. uh, it, it's, it's, what a, a country. I don't know. You know, we, I wish there was another way we could do it. But. but the answer is we have to have citizens like you, Ben, that are willing to take action to stop this kind of intervention or encroachment on judicial independence or on encroachment on consumer rights. You know, and, and unless somebody has the courage and the fortitude to do it, it will just, like you said, just repeat itself and just carry on for years and decades, uh, even centuries. Right. Well, you know, th that reminds me of two things. One is um, I met some of the uh, old uh, World War II French resistance fighters when I lived in Paris for about 17 years. And they, you know, I asked these guys, look, you only had a little gun. You know, the Nazis had, you know, Stukas and, you know, and Tiger tanks. <laughs> And, you know what I mean? I mean, they had this whole mechanized thing. You're out there in the middle of, you know, remote rural France. You're going to fight them. You know, I was like, why? You know, why would you do that? Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm expecting some kind of high level analysis from the guy. And the guy just says to me, this was not acceptable in France. That he just, I'm sorry. You know, it's like almost like the in the land. This is my land. This is not possible that I can allow this kind of thing to happen in my country. And that was just what got him to do amazingly thing, amazing things, you know? Then the other thing that I thought of is this nurse that we heard about yesterday, who's talking about at some ICE detainment, the detention center where these women have had uh, unconsented to hysterectomies and medical experimentation in Georgia. You know, she's, what, you know, she's, instead of staying quiet, she said, you know, there's something wrong here. And she was worried about human dignity. And she's come out and unbelievable what she described that happened to, to the, these, these women, you know, detained two or three years in those kind of facilities. Mm. What's it? I don't know. But the fact that she stepped forward, she's one of my heroes today, you know, just uh, a licensed uh, LPN, you know, nurse who just said, right. I'm not the highfalutin head of the thing and all that, but I know something's wrong here. You know what I mean? That, yeah. this, you know, that, that thing is really amazing. And the lawyers can help with making it right speak for those kind of plaintiffs. But, yeah. you know, 
So let me ask you folks a, a hard question. Hey, we look at who's sitting at the decision-making table hey, in the executive, in the legislative branch, in the judicial branch. Hey, and I wanna borrow from our friend David Hooker at KO School of Law in Notre Dame and pose the question, until we have representative dis diversity at those decision-making tables, will we have equal rights under the law, equal justice under the law? Well, what do you think? Judge, do you want me to put? <laughs> no, uh, go ahead, go ahead there, Professor. Go. Yes. All right, all right. So my personal view is kind of like what my ma used to say to me when Thurgood Marshall was on the Supreme Court, which is that she slept well at night knowing Thurgood Marshall was on the Supreme Court. My ma told me that. You know, and that kind of confidence in a system that she expresses, you know, with having a diverse group of people up there, with Sonia Sotomayor up there now, I'm, you know, I'm part uh, Hispanic, uh, uh, Cuban origin, you know, that has an effect. Obviously, women has an effect too. So I think, yes, we need to have a more diverse uh, courts all the way along because people come from whatever their experiences are and it affects you, you're, you're humans. And what you've experienced, what you've done, well, you know, whether you were a corporate lawyer doing um, hostile takeovers or you were doing uh, neighborhood office law or something like that, you know, a neighborhood uh, landlord tenant, whatever, it affects how you see what comes in front of you. So yeah, now that's one level is sort of the change the players and then the other level is what's the underlying law. And that's the kind of thing we were talking about before. Because if you can change the players, but if the law is the way it is, the players who have to respect the, 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 the rules, you know, stare decisis, precedent, all that, are going to be applying law that is, they'll try to find their angles maybe, but it'll, it'll be difficult. So that's the other part of it too. But the more, well, to me, I've worked in arbitration a whole lot and the the more varied the kind of people you have in the space, the more interesting ideas seem to happen. Uh, with different ways of thinking thing. No, the group think gets to be less of a group thing. And, and I find that that tends to, to, to improve the discussion. At least that's my theory for my Facebook page. I do a public service announcement on my Facebook page that I never, uh, what is it? I never uh, uh, unfriend anybody but it's a full contact space, you know? So you're all welcome in here, but you say something, I'm gonna say something or somebody else will and it's full contact. And I enjoy that, you know, to, to, that I learn from people. And so that, you know, we're not in a group thing, I don't think. But uh, more. That being the case, what's the impact of the Trump McConnell Federalist Society packing of the federal bench, all of the federal circuit court vacancies, and now more and more of the district court vacancies with young, white, right-wing Federalist Society males? Well, I'll say very, uh, well, first of all, let me say this, that one of my students who's a member of the Federal Society got me a membership for a year as sort of pulling my chain, so to speak. But I was like, okay, great. So I, was, I, I have a t-shirt from the Federalist Society um, what, what I would say is that uh, the impact is for the next 20, 30, 40 years, unfortunately, in terms of the way the law will be looked at. Now, I do think that when people have those kind of lifetime appointments, it has an effect on them. Um, and that they may have been sort of, how can I describe it, making a pitch a certain way so that they could get you know, the ambition thing. But now they've got their ambition as a district court judge. They're the ones who want to be at the Court of Appeals and the ones who want to be on the Supreme Court, they're still in that ambitious route, so to speak. But the one who are happy to be the district court judge or something like that, um, you know, I, the cases will, will bend them. I think the cases will bend them in ways that maybe not as well as I'd like, but um, I, I have some optimism. I've seen, for example, the last 20 years on the torture cases at the U.S. D.C. Circuit judges that I would have thought of that would be kind of, I don't know, very conservative, have ended up becoming kind of more cynical towards the executive's statements to them. 
after having dealt with all these things that have been said about the you know detainees at Guantanamo and all that. And that's been a healthy development in some of them. So, but it's a shame, you know, it's a shame that you can't find uh, any minority uh, um, nominees who, I mean, black, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, that with all the power of the federal government, you can't find any, when you look at the nominees, there's like all these white guys, you know, and young white guys. And it's just, it's, it's appalling really, because um, I know it's a signal being sent to people and all that, but it's so, it's just uh, sad. It's, it's really quite sad. And it, it, but there we are. That's what they want to play. But uh, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. Any well, only comment to that is I totally agree. I think diversity is a very, very critical factor in our on our bench as well as just uh, diversity in in terms of represent, representation. Um, what can we do about it? I think we just got to change the players and change the leadership to so that the leadership will respect the rule of law. They will appoint uh, people of diversity onto the bench, as well as to other commissions, et cetera. But I think basically um, we need to keep on fighting and having some trust and confidence that some of the appointees, they will respect the rule of the law, rule of law, and they will be um, at least disregard any kind of political manipulation of the rule of law. And if they do, then at least we have a core of judges that will still be an independent three eyes, right? Three eyes, judicial independence, integrity, and what's the, what was the third? Impartiality. 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 Yeah. Then they will have a core of judges that will respect the three eyes. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time today. Great note to finish on, a message to the electorate please keep in mind the importance of that judicial independence and impartiality, the challenges and threats to it, and the countermeasure that's strongest of all is your vote. Thank you all. I feel inspired. Yep, yeah, I'm ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Thank you, Judge. Again. Okay. Okay. <laughs>